Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Liz Devitt, and I'm with the Purina Institute. I am pleased to be the moderator today for the cardiology webinar. We are very fortunate to have two renowned experts with us today, Dr. John Bonagura and Dr. Dottie Laflamme, who will share their knowledge and insights, plus practical clinical approaches about the medical and nutritional management of one of the most common canine heart diseases, myxomatous mitral valve disease. But before we start our scientific program, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the Purina Institute. The Purina Institute is a global professional organization that serves as the voice of science for Purina, representing a diverse team of more than 500 pet care experts and scientists across a worldwide network Work of research and development facilities. The Purina Institute believes science is more powerful when it is shared. Through global collaborations, support for pet health initiatives, and conferences and events like this webinar, the Institute shares insights and breakthrough discoveries about proven nutritional science. Nutrition influences every aspect of a pet's life. The mission of the Purina Institute is to put nutritional conversations at the forefront of healthcare conversations about pets. The Institute does not discuss products, only science. With fact-based information, we provide veterinary health professionals like you with the information you need to have nutritional conversations with pet owners that can help pets live better, longer lives. Now that you know more about the Purina Institute, let's turn to our scientific program on the clinical and nutritional management of myxomatous mitral valve disease in dogs. Our first speaker will be Dr. John Bonagura, who will discuss the diagnosis and management of MMVD in dogs. He'll be followed by Dr. Dottie Laflamme, who will talk to us about the importance of nutritional management in canine heart disease. Then be sure to stay with us for the Q&A session where you can get your questions answered about this topic. Although our speakers are so well known that they probably don't need an introduction, I will give you brief backgrounds about both of them. Dr. Bonagura is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and Cardiology and Internal Medicine. He received his veterinary degree and his master's in veterinary physiology and pharmacology from the Ohio State University. And he currently teaches and practices clinical cardiology at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Over the next 40 minutes, he'll discuss the findings, diagnosis, staging, and management of myxomatous mitral valve disease, the most commonly acquired heart disease in dogs. After that, Dr. Dottie Laflamme will discuss the importance of nutritional management in canine heart disease. She'll also share new research findings about nutritional intervention for dogs with early stage MMVD. Dr. Laflamme is a diplomat and past president of the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. She received her DVM and her master's degree in ruminant nutrition and her PhD in nutrition and physiology from the University of Georgia. For many years, she worked in Purina's research and development with a focus on therapeutic nutrition, especially obesity management and geriatric nutrition. Dr. Laflamme now works as an independent consultant. With that, shall we get started? Hello. We're going to consider the diagnosis and management of myxomatous mitral valve disease in dogs today. I'm very pleased to be uh, here uh, representing uh, North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where I'm a member of the cardiology service. Uh, I'm also a professor emeritus of the Ohio State University, uh, as well as having some other uh, positions that relate to cardiology. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to Purina and the Purina Institute for sponsoring this lecture. So we're going to consider a number of topics today. 
The first will be the pathology of myxominous or degenerative valvular disease in dogs. And then we'll talk briefly about the incidence and then the recognition and the diagnosis of the disease, both clinical and laboratory testing and imaging. I'll give you an overview of some of the clinical outcomes that occur in this very common condition. And then we'll talk about staging of myxominous mitral valve disease. And then lastly, just summarize the pharmaceutical therapy of myxominous mitral valve disease based on the ACVIM consensus panel statement and staging. Well, what do we know? We know this is a very common disease. A myxominous mitral valve disease, also called valvular endocardiosis, is the most important heart disease in veterinary medicine. It's a degenerative disorder characterized by nodular thickening of the mitral valve leaflets. And we can see in this postmortem these thickened leaflets, but we also can appreciate that the endocardium is smooth and glistening. In other words, this is not an inflammation, but it's a thickening of the cardiac mitral and tricuspid valves associated with degenerative change. We know that the valve leaflets can appear expansive and redundant, and we often see them prolapse into the left atrium at autopsy and also by echocardiography. And we know that ruptured cord tendony are a very common problem with this condition. Now, histologically, this disease is characterized by what is called by pathologists, myxominous change. So this is a deposition of proteoglycans and disruption of the fibrosa of the mitral valve layers. Now, the mitral valve is affected by far the most commonly in dogs, but frequently there is tricuspid valve involvement. And actually the aortic valve is mildly involved in many cases, but this can only be detected by Doppler echocardiography. There's no obvious murmur. Here we can see an example of one of the major complications of chronic degenerative valve disease. So firstly, we can see this nodular thickening typical of myxominous change. But if you notice here, there is a ruptured cord tendony. And these are extremely common um, in mitral valve disease. Now, if we look at this echocardiogram, which I'll play in a moment, here's the left atrium, here's the left ventricle, and here's the aorta, you're going to see the mitral valve is flail. In other words, it has lost its support. And you're going to see it evert towards the aortic valve and then move back into the left atrium. So here we can see the mitral valve is flail and we'll change our position. Here's the anterior mitral leaflet. And now we can see a wide jet of mitral regurgitation. So again, we have a flail leaflet, here we can see the thick flail mitral leaflet and the wide jet of mitral regurgitation. Now histologically, we know the mitral valve has four distinctive layers. The one closest to the atrium is called the atrialis. Then there is an area called the spongiosa. This is the area of major thickening in myxominous change. We also have the fibrosa, which is closer to the ventricular layer or ventricularis and of course, corded tendony attached to the valve. Now, what happens in mitral valve disease is there's a marked expansion within the spongiosa. And what we can see here is a disruption of collagen that's especially easy to see on the trichrome stain and an expansion of a relatively acellular material. And these are the glycosaminoglycans or proteoglycans that are deposited in the mitral valve um, and cause the thickening and eventually the regurgitation. Now the pathogenesis of myxominous mitral valve disease is under intense study. We know there are clearly genetic predispositions. We know that there are certain breeds at very high risk. And we also know that increasing age and in many breeds, male sex lead to a higher chance of having myxominous mitral valve disease. Now in terms of the development of this. This is an area that has been studied by a number of people, and there are some excellent reviews noted in the references on the bottom of this slide. The valve interstitial cells are thought to be extremely important in the pathogenesis of this disease. There are certainly mechanical factors involved, and the endothelium of the valve also appears to have signaling that's important. Regardless of the initial triggers, there's an increase in signaling 
of serotonin and TGF beta. And this results uh, in um, increased production of protoglycans in the valve. Additionally, angiotensin II, uh, metalloproteinases, platelets, and inflammation may all play a role in the development of this disease. Uh, many older veterinarians know they've been taught that bad teeth lead to mitral valve disease. Really, the data on that is very, very weak. Um, and certainly, this is not an infection of the valve. But we do know that in many conditions, inflammation makes the generation worse. So maybe there will be something to be found uh, in the future. Now, eventually, this signaling results in increases in protoglycans deposited within the mitral valve and increase in the extracellular matrix, mainly in the spongiosa layer of the valve. And there's disruption of collagen and elastin fibers in the fibrosa. And as a result, the mitral valve and tricuspid valves become thickened and they change their structure such that they no longer close properly and regurgitation develops. Now, in terms of prevalence, this again is the most important heart disease in veterinary medicine. We know from early studies, and we also know from more recent studies done mainly in Europe and very large studies, that this is the most prevalent cause of heart disease in dogs and also in general and in specialty practices. Now, there have been estimates, and the estimates do vary, but about 10% of dogs presenting to primary care veterinarians are thought to have some evidence of myxominous mitral valve disease. Myxominous mitral valve disease accounts for about 70% of all canine heart disease in general practice. It would be slightly less than that in a specialty practice, but even there, we see many cases. For example, in our own practice at North Carolina State, we probably see at least 600 dogs per year, at least, who have myxominous valvular disease. We know that increasing age increases the incidence and there are strong breed predilections. So let's talk about the recognition and the diagnosis of myxominous mitral valve disease in dogs. Cardiac auscultation is the practical way that we as veterinarians recognize myxominous mitral valve disease. And what we can see is that the mitral valve will create either a murmur or a click. If you look to the right, you can see the arrow is pointing to a prolapsing tricuspid valve. And prolapse of the tricuspid or the mitral valve will often lead to mid-systolic clicks that could be heard well on the left or on the right side. These are often misdiagnosed as gallop sounds. I can play for you a click. Notice the click comes and goes and changes. And you can see why these are frequently misdiagnosed as gallop sounds, but they're really systolic sounds of valve prolapse. Now, the most common feature that we hear is a progressively louder systolic murmur. This will usually be loudest on the left where the mitral valve is and at the apex because the mitral murmur radiates to the left apex. We'll often hear murmurs on the right. These may be tricuspid regurgitation or radiating murmurs of mitral regurgitation. In general, if there's a louder murmur on the right, if it is a different frequency or pitch, or if there's a palpable vibration or thrill, it is probably an independent tricuspid regurgitation murmur. Now, the typical murmur of mitral regurgitation will be so long and loud that it may obscure the heart sounds. So here's a holosystolic murmur of mitral regurgitation. Now, again, this disease is most common in older dogs um, and usually smaller breed dogs. The greatest risk is clearly with the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, although the Shih Tzu and the Dachshund are often affected uh, very often. Now again, auscultation is really the key to diagnosis. We have a number of very nice studies comparing auscultation uh, between observers 
and looking at color Doppler verification of auscultation. And the simple point is that auscultation is the most practical screening test for clinically relevant valve disease. Now you may see research studies that look at color Doppler, but my perspective on this is that these are research studies. There's no logical reason to screen dogs for myxominous mitral valve disease unless you're conducting breeding trials or research. So our stethoscope is the practical way to recognize this disease. Many people ask, is there a correlation between murmur intensity and severity? And I would say yes, to some degree there is. Certainly very soft murmurs are usually associated with mild disease and very little, if any, remodeling. These are localized murmurs that are very soft. Conversely, really loud murmurs, grade five or six, murmurs that are thrilling or have a precordial thrill are largely always associated with some degree of remodeling. But having said that, you can have a moderate murmur that radiates and the dog can be fine for another two or three years. And you can have a moderate murmur in a patient who has congestive heart failure. So while there is a general statistical trend towards a louder murmur, you cannot tell if a dog needs therapy based only on the loudness of the murmur. Having said that, a very soft murmur argues against significant remodeling or enlargement at this time. The other point that's a bit of a corollary is we see many small breed dogs with respiratory signs, especially cough. And remember that in a small breed dog with um, respiratory signs, but no murmur, it is very unlikely that this dog is in congestive heart failure. Heart failure is a syndrome. You have to have a disease before you can have heart failure. So unless you're going to diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy, it's very hard to make a dog, especially a small breed dog, have heart failure without the presence of a cardiac murmur. Now, how do we verify myxominous mitral valve disease? Well, here you can see an example in this echocardiogram of the left atrium, the left ventricle, and we can see uh, a very thickened mitral valve. In the close-up, you can see a ruptured cord tendony flipping back into the left atrium. And we can verify the regurgitation either with our stethoscope or with color Doppler imaging. Here we can see a turbulent green signal of mitral regurgitation. You can also see in this patient substantial left atrial enlargement and a very rounded and dilated left ventricle. Now, practically, most veterinarians are going to assess the severity of this disease based on radiographs. And what we know is that chronic mitral regurgitation will lead to progressive left atrial and left ventricular enlargement. Now, we know that this is a very slowly progressing disease. For example, this is a dog who had a grade three murmur, but it took over two years to develop a heart of this size. We can see the very prominent left auricle. We can see the enlarged left atrium, and we can see the very elongated heart due to left ventricular enlargement. Yet this dog is still not in congestive heart failure. So it's often four or five years from the first onset of a heart murmur until we see so-called symptoms of heart failure. And also remember that the most rapid increase in heart size occurs about six months before the onset of congestive heart failure. And this has been well shown by both studies of Peter Lord and his colleagues, as well as by the EPIC clinical trial data. Now, another way we can look for changes in heart size is to use a blood test, a biomarker. Remember that the heart is an endocrine organ. And when the left atrium or left ventricle are stretched, they release peptide hormones called A-type and B-type natriuretic peptides. As their names say, these cause sodium diuresis or naturesis, and they cause vasodilation. Think of them as the opposite of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So a suitable stretch, um, there will be genetic changes that result in the formation and release of B-type natriuretic peptide from the ventricle. Now, within the blood, an enzyme, furin or corin, splits this into an active hormone and an inactive nitrogen fragment. And this nitrogen terminal 
of the pro-hormone is what we measure in the blood. So this is the non-biologically active biomarker that you would measure um, when you record an NT pro BMP or a BMP test in a dog. Now the active hormone, the carboxy end of this uh, peptide is actually going to have the natriuretic and vasodilator effects. Now this hormone is broken down by enzymes that are often called neutral uh, endopeptidases like neprilysin. And there are now drugs and even small canine studies that look at the drug secubitrol and related drugs that actually inhibit this breakdown of natriuretic peptides. And this may be a future therapy. Now, while natriuretic peptides clearly increase and increase as a risk for heart failure, you have to be careful. This is a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with a grade five mitral murmur and just an occasional cough, but a normal sleeping respiratory rate. This dog's NT pro BMP is far over the upper limit, which is often published at about 800 picomoles per liter. This dog was over 3000, yet is not in congestive heart failure. So think of this biomarker as a risk factor, indicating a risk for cardiac enlargement, a risk for congestive failure, but you cannot treat or diagnose congestive heart failure conclusively based only on the natriuretic peptide test. Now, other diagnostic tests have their role. Now, in a dog who has normal sinus rhythm on auscultation, an electrocardiogram is going to be of minimal value. However, in patients with arrhythmias that often complicate myxominous mitral valve disease, such as premature atrial beats, focal atrial tachycardias, or atrial fibrillation, which we can see here in a dog with an irregular rhythm, no P waves, and very large voltages typical of left ventricular enlargement. We know that an electrocardiogram will be needed to define those heart arrhythmias. And they also have therapeutic implications because in atrial fibrillation, we will still consider using digoxin if renal function is satisfactory. And we may need to use diltiazem, the calcium channel blocker, to slow conduction down the AV node in order to get heart rate control. Now, blood pressure is also important. We know that when blood pressure is high, that it increases the left ventricular pressure, and that in turn increases the left atrial pressure. So measuring blood pressure non-invasively is very important in these patients. Many of them have chronic kidney disease, or Cushing's disease, and these comorbidities are a risk for systemic hypertension. There are also therapeutic implications. In patients with elevated blood pressure, probably an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker would be indicated therapy. And if that's not sufficient, you may need to use a more direct vasodilator, such as amlodipine or hydralazine to control blood pressure, especially in patients with congestive heart failure. Well, what are the clinical outcomes of myxominous mitral valve disease? Well, these include enlargement of the heart, which we generally call remodeling today. There are different stages of heart failure that can progress to congestive heart failure. And then we have other comorbidities and complications, both of the disease and other conditions that can affect the heart failure state. So first, let's look at this in perspective. Uh, Borgarelli showed that the six-year mortality of preclinical disease was only 10%. And he wrote that preclinical myxominous mitral valve disease represents a relatively benign condition in dogs and further emphasized that stratification based on clinical and echocardiographic findings is helpful in determining treatment. I think we would all agree with that. Not every dog should be on medicine. And you certainly do not treat a dog simply because it has a murmur or a louder murmur. Those are not indications for treating. So what we have to look for then are remodeling or early signs of cardiac dysfunction. Now remodeling really means cardiomegaly, but there's also changes in the myocardium and valvular tissue and even in heart function that are very difficult, if not impossible to measure in primary mitral valve disease. We also see patients with heart failure, but without congestion. The problem is what's the most sensitive sign of heart failure? 
it's probably reduced exercise capacity. And most clients miss this. They simply attribute it to their dog getting old or osteoarthritis or some other reason. But importantly, remodeling provides us a window for therapeutic intervention to delay the onset of congestive failure. Now, we know that once congestive heart failure has manifested, pulmonary edema will occur, and left-sided failure is more common than right-sided failure. We also know that many dogs develop pulmonary hypertension, either from passive backup of pressure or from independent pulmonary arterial change. Dogs with severe pulmonary hypertension have profound exercise intolerance. They often collapse or faint with exercise and they may have ascites. We also see arrhythmias such as atrial arrhythmias that I previously showed you, bronchial compression from a large left atrium, and even patients who come in in shock with pericardial effusion or even acquired atrial septal defects from rupturing their left atrium well, here's an example of the remodeling that we can see. This is a dog with severe mitral valve disease. Here's an apical view and a long axis view. You can see the marked increase in left atrial size. And I think in this apical view, you can see the left ventricle also appears to be very dilated, though the image is somewhat foreshortened. You can appreciate the dilated pulmonary veins. And you can also see that the tricuspid valve is prolapsing here and here. So we clearly have evidence of valvular disease and remodeling by echo. We also know that um, the radiographs are very important for staging, especially in general practice. And everyone should be familiar with performing a vertebral heart sum or score. And we know that this is done by taking the length of the heart and the width of the heart, and then comparing it to the number of vertebrae, starting with the fourth thoracic vertebrae. And when we add up the length and the width, we wind up with the vertebral heart sum. Now there's a great deal, a great deal of breed variation with vertebral heart size. So it's very challenging to just use a value for all breeds. Um, most importantly, I think is shown here from this study from Lord. Notice how over years, there is very little change in the vertebral heart sum. But then right before the dogs develop congestive heart failure, there's this sudden increase in vertebral heart size. And that's why serial radiographs can be very helpful in practice for predicting who needs therapy and also who's likely to go into congestive heart failure. And a general recommendation, this is my recommendation based on reading the data, not from Dr. Lord specifically, but if you have a, a 0.1 vertebral body change per month, that is a high risk for congestive heart failure. So if, for example, you changed one vertebral body over 10 months, that would be a dog at very high risk for heart failure. Now, we also know that echocardiography um, is a standard for uh, not only diagnosing or confirming, but staging heart disease. And we know that if you measure the left ventricular cavity size by two dimension or by M mode, or if you measure the left atrial size, especially if you compare it to the aorta, we know that both left atrial and left ventricular size correlates to remodeling. And in the EPIC clinical trial, a left ventricular dimension that was normalized to body weight and equal or exceeded 1.7 was a high risk for benefiting from pimobendin therapy. In other words, these dogs would be treated with pimobendin. And these same dogs had a left atrial to aortic ratio exceeding 1.6. I am much more in favor of this because this is easier and more consistent to measure. This often has different angles going through the left atrium. And so the variability is much higher. I would never just use one of these. I would always use both of these to decide if I was going to start therapy. And remember that the heart function won't help you. It's almost always hyperdynamic in dogs with mitral disease. Now, what we know from the EPIC clinical trial is that there was a benefit of pimobendin to delay congestive heart failure. And here are the criteria. These dogs were six years of age or older. They were small breed dogs, um, less than 15 kilograms, and they had a moderately loud heart murmur, which means you could hear it readily 
and it radiated to more than one area, usually to the right side as well. The two-dimensional echo was done and had characteristic valve lesions that I've already shown you. I think even people with basic ultrasound skills can see this quite readily. Color Doppler was used to confirm auscultation or, uh, and the presence of mitral regurgitation, but practically speaking, I think you can use your stethoscope if color Doppler is not available. And then they looked at remodeling based on what I just showed you, the left atrial to aortic ratio and the normalized left ventricular ratio. There was also a um, vertebral heart sums entry point of more than 10.5. I crossed that out because that should not be used. That is not sufficient. Many normal cavaliers have a heart with that vertebral heart size. Now, one alternative, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, is using the vertebral heart score velocity. If you cannot perform echocardiography, uh, an option will be to look at changes in vertebral heart score. Now, the therapeutic impact of this study was you start vetmedin. If all of these characteristics are fulfilled, you would start vetmedin. And this had a substantial delay, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, what are alternatives when echocardiography is not practical? We all know that many of our clients will never have an echocardiogram done for their dog. Well, we can measure the vertebral heart size, and we can also measure what's called the vertebral left atrial size or score. And that is done by measuring from the top of the caudal vena cava to the carina, to the base of the carina. And what we know from a couple of studies by Pode and colleagues at Penn and by Stepin and colleagues at Wisconsin is that if a VHS is less than 10.8, it's very unlikely to fulfill EPIC criteria. Whereas if it's more than 11.5 to 11.7, it probably will fulfill EPIC criteria. And that might be a dog more likely to be started on therapy, even without an echocardiogram. Um, the vertebral left atrial score is very helpful to identify left atrial enlargement. If it's more than 2.3, it's probably slightly enlarged, but 2.8 to 3 are much more specific vertebral left atrial scores for correlating to moderate left atrial enlargement. Okay. Now, in terms of outcomes, we know that in addition to remodeling, patients develop congestive heart failure, as you can see in this Afghan. Now, what we know is that if clients monitor the sleeping or resting respiratory rate, their rates of less than 25 when sleeping are good, and even 30 are probably acceptable. But when they're over 35 per minute when they're sleeping or there are upward trends, they're more likely to be developing congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. This will be recognized by us as cardiomegaly, a large left atrium and left ventricle. And this is where vertebral heart size and vertebral left atrial score can be helpful because this is a very deep chested Afghan and we don't see the trachea that elevated, but this dog has a very large heart. We can also see pulmonary vascular prominence here, a dilated pulmonary vein, and we can see pulmonary infiltrates that are compatible with pulmonary edema, remembering that in acute pulmonary edema, they can be very widespread. We can also recognize pulmonary infiltrates with ultrasound. Here you can see um, what are called B lines or lung rockets. Um, and these are because fluid and air together become a generator of ultrasound that is non attenuating into the far field. Um, we know from studies and the VET Blue uh, study um, that if you see single B lines, that these can be normal. But the more B lines you see, the greater the likelihood that this patient has an interstitial alveolar type syndrome of increased pulmonary density. This is certainly not specific for congestive heart failure, but it is certainly suggestive with other clinical signs. Um, recent papers have looked at this and have verified the point that you need to still take chest radiographs to be sure of congestive heart failure in many cases. We also see as an outcome pulmonary hypertension. Here you see a dog with ascites from right heart failure. This dog has an eccentric jet of tricuspid regurgitation and if we sample it, we can see there's high velocity. This is actually after therapy in this dog. Um, and one of the things that we know about ascites in this disease is it often occurs from a combination of tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, and often atrial fibrillation. These 
three things are very likely to lead to ascites. And the therapeutic principle is that phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors um, are often prescribed if pulmonary hypertension persists after initial therapy for left-sided heart failure. Here are other complications. Here we can see a dog with a very large left atrium and has bronchial compression. The left bronchus is compressed. Here's an old bronchoscopy that I did from a different dog. And you can see that the right bronchus is open, but the left bronchus is compressed. This dog also had chronic bronchitis, which is very common in this as a comorbidity in this condition. And here we see a dog with an echogenic pericardial effusion. Um, this echogenic pericardial effusion um, it has resulted um, in compression of the heart and shock. So the therapeutic complications here or indications are that we know we can reduce heart size with pimobendin and furosemide. This will sometimes help coughing due to bronchial compression. We know that sometimes we just have to resort to respiratory medicines for severe coughing like prednisone, hydrocodone, or other cough suppressants. And thirdly, sometimes we need to remove pericardial blood, especially in hypotensive patients who have a ruptured left atrium. And we've sent many of these patients home with ruptured left atrium, but you must recognize the condition. They usually come in collapsed, hypotensive, and with a softer murmur than they had before. Well, lastly, let's look at the four stages of myxomatous disease and how we treat them. So dogs in stage A are dogs who have a uh, risk of having myxomatous mitral valve disease, but have no evidence of disease. So any small breed older dog would be at risk. Stages B1 and B2 are dogs who have mitral regurgitation, but no clinical signs of heart failure. Stage B1 are dogs who have insufficient remodeling to justify therapy. So either their heart size is normal or there's not enough remodeling in order to justify therapy. And dogs in B2 have enough cardiomegaly sufficient to treat based on clinical trial evidence. Dogs in stage C are similar to the Afghan I just showed you. They're in congestive heart failure. And dogs in stage D have chronic heart failure that is non-responsive to standard twice daily dosing um, of common medications. So how then do we treat um, these pharmacologically? Let me just provide a summary if I can. So first we know that there's a great deal of controversy in asymptomatic stage B disease. One study of Cavaliers with enalapril showed no difference between placebo and the onset of congestive heart failure. These are survival curves, but they're actually related to the development of congestive failure. And you can see there's no difference. The VETPROOF trial took different breeds and perhaps more severe disease, but also found only a marginal benefit of enalapril versus placebo, a four month delay in heart failure with over two years of therapy. Um, the more recently published delay study looked at more combined RAS inhibition with spironolactone and benazepril, a drug that you probably know as Cardalis. And what they found was that if you looked at the primary endpoint of developing congestive failure or early cardiac death, again, these are dogs with stage B2. They're not in congestive failure. ACE inhibition with benazepril and spironolactone did not delay the onset of congestive failure, though there was some potential for less remodeling. And importantly, pimobendin was not included in this study, so we don't know how the combination works. Um, the EPIC trial, though, was very positive. This was a study of dogs with stage B2 mitral valve disease who received either pimobendin or placebo. And what you can see from these survival curves, again, to the endpoint of congestive heart failure or unexplained or sudden cardiac death was that pimobendin had about a 15 month extension in the time to the development of cardiac related disease. So these dogs remain asymptomatic without clinical signs for 15 months longer, uh, about on average, when they were taking pimobendin. 
So what about the stage C dog? This is quite straightforward. These are dogs who receive sedation with butorphanol, intravenous furosemide, oxygen, pimobendin, initially in our practice, three times a day, and then to the standard label twice a day, and might even receive vasodilators. These dogs are life in life-threatening heart failure in many cases and require fairly vigorous hospital therapy, although some earlier cases can be treated readily as an outpatient with an injection of furosemide and starting oral therapy. Um, in cases that require aggressive therapy, we may more sufficiently either afterload or preload reduce either with topical nitroglycerin, with hydralazine or amlodipine, or very aggressively with nitroprusside or nitroglycerin. These will reduce filling pressures by dilating veins and also reduce the load on the left ventricle. There are very few clinical studies looking at the efficacy of these drugs, but many uh, hospitals will use these for life-threatening fulminant pulmonary edema. Here's an example of a dog with life-threatening pulmonary edema. You can see the diffuse pulmonary infiltrates, and 18 hours later, uh, with aggressive therapy that included nitroprusside, this dog was stable and was eventually able to be released from the hospital. Um, when there's severe pulmonary hypertension as a comorbidity, these dogs will usually present with ascites. And in that case, um, um, we will do abdominocentesis to relieve tense ascites. And if we demonstrate protracted pulmonary hypertension that is severe despite therapy for left heart failure, we will provide either sildenafil or tadalafil in order to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. But we usually in our practice first treat dogs for left heart failure if that has not yet been done. And then lastly, what is the home therapy for heart failure? Um, I tell my students dogs are for special people and that indicates diet. And of course, what we do is uh, in early stages of heart disease, as the heart remodels, we certainly start to think about dietary changes and reducing sodium and dogs that are in heart failure will be given restricted sodium diets and high protein diets. I'll have a colleague talk about that. We give ACE inhibitors in our practice. We give furosemide, we give spironolactone, we give pimobendin. But having said that, there are varying levels of evidence. There are strong levels of evidence for pimobendin and furosemide. And there are much weaker, some would say insufficient evidence for ACE inhibitors and spironolactone. I think the problem that I see is we do not have a sufficient trial that combines all four of these treatments to see if they are superior to any two or any three. Those studies are not really available. Um, and in terms of practicality, depending on where you live, these drugs can be very inexpensive or very expensive. So that will often modify the therapeutic approach in general practice. So lastly, if we look at the key drugs to treat this disease, we know loop diuretics like furosemide and torsemide will treat active congestive failure, reducing edema and effusions, and also prevent them. In stage D, advanced heart failure, we switch to torsemide, and you always have to follow renal function versus the severity of congestive failure. These are a balance between the two in deciding on the dosage. Pimobendin is a potent inodilator. We start it in stage B2, and we continue it all the way through stage D. We often increase the frequency and dosage as an extra label treatment in stage D congestive failure. Spironolactone, and this should be an ACE inhibitor, um, spironolactone is used for neurohormonal protection. It also prevents potassium loss, and it may have incremental value. And the same is true for neurohormonal protection with the ACE inhibitors that are often combined with spironolactone, such as enalapril, venazapril, ramipril, and quinapril. But I think we need more data on these drugs and especially on the dosing of ACE inhibitors to see how much incremental value they may provide. So I've tried to provide a, an overview of exominous mitral valve disease in terms of uh, the findings, the diagnosis, the staging and the management. I certainly do appreciate your attention. And I, I thank you for watching this video. 
and I will take questions at a later time. Thank you so very much. Have a good day. Hello, I'm Dr. Dottie Laflamme, a veterinary nutritionist, and I'm here to speak to you about nutritional management and canine heart disease. Before we start on heart disease, I want to cover something a little bit more broad, and that's meeting the goal for nutritional management for all your patients, dogs or cats, horses, cows, whatever it might be. The first and foremost thing with the diet is to meet the nutritional needs, in this case of the dog or the cat. That means providing complete and balanced nutrition enough calories and protein to maintain body weight and body condition, as well as lean body mass. Once you've met those needs, then we can move on to think about managing the clinical signs caused by disease. In some cases, we might even be able to slow or prevent progression of the disease with the overall goal to maintain or enhance quality of life in these patients. So moving on to talk about heart disease in particular, I wanna start by sharing the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Consensus Committee's nutritional guidelines based on the stages of mitral valve disease and heart failure. So these stages run from stage A, which is an animal who has no evidence of heart disease, but is at risk either because of breed genetics or some other predisposing situation. A dog in stage B1 has very, very early changes, but, um, but they're very minimal. Stage B2, we have more changes. We're starting to see some changes in the heart, but there's no clinical signs of heart disease in the B2 stage. Stage three would be a dog in congestive heart failure. Stage four would be more advanced heart failure. According to the ACVIM guidelines, nutritional management is an important consideration, but starting at B2 with mild sodium restriction and also assuring that calories and protein are adequate to maintain optimum body weight to help reduce any risk for cachexia, manage obesity, things of that sort. And they suggest a highly palatable diet because animals that are starting to have disease may have problems with food intake. But they really focus on nutrition when it comes to stage C and D, the more advanced conditions, where they suggest modest sodium restriction, so slightly more sodium restriction than at B2. But there their focus is really on preventing cachexia maintaining adequate protein and calorie intake with a highly palatable diet, and also adding omega-3 fatty acids, which not only have anti-inflammatory benefits, but may have some benefit in terms of managing cachexia, and also monitoring any excesses or deficiencies and making adjustments accordingly. So let's talk about sodium and some of these other nutrients. Let's start with sodium because that's often the first nutrient that comes to mind when talking about heart disease. Sodium, of course, is the primary osmotic agent in the extracellular fluid, so it drives blood volume. Where sodium goes, water follows. In healthy dogs, the balance of sodium and with it the associated water is controlled through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone or RAS system. As the heart fails, systemic blood pressure can drop and the body attempts to increase this blood pressure by increasing sodium retention and water. The problem though, is this is often overshot and that results in fluid overload, edema or congestive heart failure. In dogs with heart disease, low sodium diets have long been recommended. And it has been shown in a few studies that these dogs, so dogs with congestive heart failure fed a low sodium diet, do show some decrease in heart volume. Uh, but the problem with the very low sodium diets is that they tend to induce electrolyte abnormality, specifically hyperkalemia. The other thing about sodium that's more recently recognized 
is that low sodium intake triggers the RAS system in order to retain sodium. Problems with that is that prolonged RAS stimulation promotes inflammation and oxidative stress, as well as renal glomerular damage and vascular damage. So in dogs with heart disease, a low sodium diet actually stimulates the RAS earlier and more severely compared to dogs fed with normal or moderate or even high sodium diets. And multiple studies in humans suggest that excessive restriction of sodium actually increases cardiac mortality. So what is too low in dogs with congestive heart failure? Unfortunately, there's no controlled studies to determine optimum levels. But from among the studies that have been done, the too low level would be 13 to 27 milligrams per 100 kcal or 0.05 to 1 to 0.1 percent sodium on a dry matter basis. At this level, they have identified early activation of the RAS system, worsening of clinical scores, and evidence of oxidative stress due to the RAS. Also, electrolyte abnormalities and decompensation and azotemia when these low sodium levels were used along with diuretics or ACE inhibitors. Other studies used a moderate sodium intake around 40 to 70 milligrams per 100 kcal, which is about 0.2 to 0.25% on a dry matter basis. At this level, there were no adverse effects observed, even when used with diuretics and ACE inhibitors. So what does this translate to in terms of products on the market? The two level, the two low level, is fairly consistent with a lot of cardiac diets that are ultra restricted in sodium. Whereas the acceptable level is the level uh, typically found in kidney diets or properly formulated heart diets. The other nutrient that we mentioned before was omega-3 fatty acids in, in heart disease and very specifically the long chain uh, omega-3s from fish oil, the EPA and DHA, which are recognized as anti-inflammatory. These provide numerous benefits, such as a reduction in pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, thromboxanes, interleukins, and cytokines, a reduction in thrombosis, blood pressure, reduction in arrhythmias, and also reduced risk for cachexia. Calorie and protein intake is critical in our cardiac patients in part to try to um, control for or, or minimize the risk of cachexia as much as possible. One thing to consider is that most of our dogs that have heart disease are older dogs and they need to have adequate protein for their age as well as for their condition. And older dogs tend to actually need more protein compared to younger adult dogs. So it's important that the diet fed to dogs with heart disease contain at least 25% of calories from good quality protein. Palatability and digestibility in the diet are also important. Many dogs with congestive heart failure may be anorectic, either from the disease or from medications. Um, so highly palatable foods can be important. Small frequent meals may be helpful. Warming wet foods to body temperature may help as well. Dogs with congestive heart failure also may have decreased blood flow to the GI tract and therefore compromised digestive function. A highly digestible diet may be of benefit. And as previously mentioned, omega-3 fatty acids may be beneficial in the management of cachexia. So those are what the ACVIM has talked about. However, I want to point out that there's other nutrients of importance to heart health that can be very important. We're going to talk about those next. One of these is magnesium, one of the macro minerals that doesn't get enough share of voice. Magnesium is a cofactor in hundreds of enzymes, and it's critical for uh, ATP production, protein production, and cardiovascular function. 
low levels of magnesium are associated with greater risk for cardiovascular disease and associated mortality in humans and mitral valve calcification and prolapse in both humans and dogs. Shown here are some of the many roles that magnesium serves specific to cardiac function. Things like modulation of muscle tone, regulation of blood pressure, anti-arrhythmic uh, benefits, decreases in, anti, uh, decreases in inflammatory mediators, enhanced mitochondrial function, and decreased free radical production for a redu reduction in oxidative damage. Free radicals takes us to our next topic, which is antioxidants. So free radicals are produced by normal metabolism, but in disease states, there can be an increase in free radical production and often a decrease in available antioxidants such that it creates an imbalance or oxidative stress. Studies have shown that in both dogs and humans with heart disease, there's evidence of increased oxidative stress and oxidative stress itself can lead to an increase in inflammatory mediators. So antioxidants are important in heart health. Taurine is another nutrient of importance. It's a beta amino acid. So it's not incorporated into proteins, but serves many functions in the body. Concentrations of taurine are highest in muscle, both skeletal muscle and heart muscle. And some of the functions that are important in heart include maintenance of contractile function, osmotic regulation, the myocardium, mitochondrial function and ATP production, as well as it's serving an antioxidant function and reduction of mitochondrial free radical production. As you're all aware, a, a deficiency of taurine can lead to heart failure in both cats and dogs. A final nutrient of importance is carnitine or its precursors, lysine and methionine. Carnitine is a peptide derivative. It's produced endogenously or provided in the diet. And one of its very important roles is to serve as a co-transporter for long chain fatty acids to cross into the inner mitochondrial membrane to be metabolized for ATP production. Normal heart muscle is dependent on fatty acid oxidation. So it's dependent on a source of carnitine to facilitate fatty acid oxidation. Dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy may have a myocardial carnitine deficiency, even if their plasma levels of carnitine are normal, high, or low. Supplementation has been used in dogs, but as far as research to support the benefit of carnitine, there's only very little research but many anecdotal reports, and it is commonly used to provide carnitine precursors or carnitine for dogs with heart disease. What I'd like to share with you now are highlights from several studies done by a colleague of mine, Dr. Johnny Lee, looking at whether or not supplementation with these nutrients I just mentioned can actually be beneficial earlier in dogs that have mitral valve disease. Starting with a multiple omics study where um, serum metabolites as well as uh, tissue transcript omics on, from dogs with and without mitral valve disease were evaluated. And based on the, the omics of that, they were able to identify derangements in cardiac energy metabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction. Changes in energy substrate shifting away from fatty acids to glucose and other uh, less efficient uh, energy sources compared to the fatty acids. Also alterations in oxidative phosphorylation, reduced ATP production, increases in oxidative stress and increases in inflammatory mediators. So these are changes occurring in dogs with mitral valve disease disease and heart failure. And so we developed a blend, a cardiac protection blend of nutrients to address these 
changes in the diseased dogs in order to compensate for these metabolic changes. So these included the nutrients that we've talked about, antioxidants, specifically vitamin E and taurine, anti-inflammatory nutrients, the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, nutrients to provide mitochondrial support, including magnesium, carnitine precursors, taurine, and medium chain triglycerides, as well as an alternative energy source in the form of medium chain triglycerides. So medium chain triglycerides are available as an alternative energy source. They're fatty acids, but they're much shorter than your typical long chain fatty acids. So they're much more easily digested, absorbed across the cell membranes. Using MCT or the fatty acids from those results in a two to six fold increase in myocardial acetyl-CoA, so an easier energy source, increased beta oxidation of fatty acids at the mitochondrial level, decreased free radical productions, an increase in ATP, an increased contractile function in a hypertrophic cardiac disease model. Medium chain fatty acids are also a source of ketones. The liver can convert them to generate ketones. And both the medium chain fatty acids and the ketones are readily used by the heart muscle in proportion to the concentration available. So while the heart, the diseased heart has a reduced ability to metabolize long chain fatty acids, it has no difficulty metabolizing ketones or medium chain fatty acids. So a, a formulation was created with the cardiac protection blend of nutrients and fed to dogs that had mitral valve disease stage B1 and B2. This graph is showing you the metabolome of the serum from those dogs at baseline and after six months. You can see at baseline, the dogs were all pretty similar. But after six months on the diet, they separated completely in terms of their metabolome. Some of these changes were related to the diet, in other words, differences in fatty acids and so forth. But the net of the changes were associated with increased energy metabolism, uh, increased efficiency of fat oxidation, reduction in oxidative stress and inflammation. Perhaps more importantly is the actual clinical outcome. So this is looking at the left atrial diameter on the top and the left atrium to aortic root on the bottom. And we know in mitral valve disease that the size of the atria is an important marker as the disease progresses. We also know that mitral valve disease is normally a slowly progressive disease. So finding changes within a six month window is a little bit surprising. And yet we saw significant differences. What we see in the solid line on both graphs is the control dogs. And the dotted line is the dogs fed the cardiac protection blend. And there was actually a increase in atrial size in the control dogs, averaging about a 10% increase and a slight decrease in size and the dogs fed the cardiac protection blend, averaging about a 3% decrease. So that significant difference is an important difference. This is showing mitral regurgitation in those dogs based on a scoring, none, mild, moderate, or severe. The dogs in the control group are on the left and the, and the cardiac protection blend dogs are on the right. What you can see is that most of the dogs, the control dogs did not change, but about 25% of them actually showed some worsening over the six month study. Amongst the dogs on the left, only 10% showed any worsening and about 30% actually improved over the six month study. So this is showing progression from ACVIM stage B1 to B2. And again, the control dogs are on the left, the cardiac protection blends are on the right and showing in black is, is stage B2, in gray is stage B1. As you can see on the control dogs, there was progression, whereas none of the dogs on the cardiac protection blend progressed 
from B1 to B2. Again, a significant difference. So based on this study, these studies, I should say, and uh, the ACVM guidelines, when do we want to start dietary management for heart disease? Well, the ACVIM guidelines suggest starting sodium restriction at stage B2. But based on the research that Dr. Lee has published, it actually suggests starting sooner when dogs are in stage B1. And not just restriction of sodium, but providing a complete blend of cardiac protection blend nutrients, including medium chain triglycerides, omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil, carnitine precursors, magnesium, taurine, and antioxidants together. So in summary, this is looking at all the different nutrients we've talked about and the role that they may play in either congestive heart failure or in early stage mitral valve disease. The square box outlines this, the nutrients that were included in Dr. Lee's research, showing that this combination of nutrients was very helpful in early stage mitral valve disease. The blue boxes are showing nutrients that may be important in congestive heart failure, according to the ACVIM. But what you can see from this chart is that these two types of diet for early stage and congestive heart failure are not necessarily exclusive of one another. So the mitral valve uh, diet with that cardiac protection blend with moderate sodium restriction can be appropriate at all stages of heart disease. So when do we start? As early as needed in stage B1 and continue it throughout as much as needed. Thank you very much for your attention.